Good evening and welcome to The Journey Home. My name is Marcus Grodi, your host for this program in which I have the great privilege of introducing to you men and women who, because of their great love for Jesus Christ, were brought home to the Catholic Church. Often we receive emails from viewers who say they particularly like Jewish converts or they like uh, Mormon converts, but another request often comes in. They love to hear the stories of those who converted to the Catholic Church from Jehovah Witness. And such is our guest tonight, Jeffrey Schwem, is a, not only a convert from Jehovah Witness, we'll talk about, he's a little bit <laughs> wider journey, which is, uh, I think, a very interesting and very unique tonight. So I'm glad you've tuned in. But you're an important part of the program. So if you have a question for Jeffrey, give us a call at 1-800-221-9460. Or if you're outside North America, you can give us a call at 205 271 2980, or you can send us an email at journeyhome, one word, at EWTN.com. Jeffrey, welcome to the Journey Home Hi. program. Thank you, Marcus. As I was mentioning to the audience, uh, we don't have that many converts from the Jehovah Witness. It's great when we do have one, but to have a convert who's both a convert from the Jehovah Witness and the Missouri Synod Lutheran is a bit more rare. <laughs> well, I know that there's at least three of us, if you include my <laughs> wife and a friend of mine in Atlanta. All right. Um, is there some direct connect between Jehovah's Witness, Missouri Synod Lutheran, and the Catholic Church? <laughs> well, I don't know about that. I was going to say that seems, <laughs> yeah, that's not exactly three dots makes a straight line. No, it's not. <laughs> it most certainly is not. But it's great to have you on the program. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. And uh, you probably never dreamed that you'd be on this side of a Catholic television. Uh, no, never in a million years thought I would ever uh, do something like this. Yeah. Well, it's great to have you here because you used to watch the Journey Home program, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, the Journey Home program had a big uh, part in my conversion to okay. the Catholic Church. I can imagine trying to get the thoughts that first time you saw the show and, and you know, now here you are on that side. Right, so, right, right. Okay. It's, it's, well, it's unbelievable. It's great to have you here. Thank Every you week, me. if you've seen the program, you know I like to begin by inviting the guests to give us a background check. Sure. So give us a little summary of your spiritual background. Um, uh, my uh, mother, when, when I was about five years old, my mother um, became a Jehovah's Witness. Uh, this occurred not long after her mom had died. Uh, my mother was a Missouri Synod Lutheran, and uh, my, my earliest years of going to church, I remember going to a, a Lutheran church. It was a St. John Lutheran uh, Church on Canal Boulevard in New Orleans, Louisiana. And uh, I was baptized there, so I received that grace from my uh, Lutheran brothers and sisters. And um, also, uh, I remember going to Sunday school and learning that Jesus loved me and, and all those great and wonderful things. Um, when I was around five, and I don't think I completely understood what was going on, but my mother quit going to the Lutheran church. Um, my father, who was actually a, a non-practicing Catholic, tried to take us to Mass periodically, but I never really could figure out what was going on there. And then um, I started going from door to door when I was six years old. Wow. I gave my first uh, speech in front of the congregation at a kingdom hall, which is where the Jehovah's Witnesses meet when I was eight. Um, they didn't recognize my baptism in the Lutheran church, so I had a believer's baptism when I was 17. And then I became a, uh, what they call a, a pioneer minister. That's someone who goes from door to door a thousand hours a year uh, looking for non-believers to convert oh. them to the watchtower. Of course, a non-believer is anyone who isn't a Jehovah's Witness. Correct, okay. correct. Then when I was 19, I was invited to serve at the world headquarters of Jehovah's Witnesses in Brooklyn, New York. And I spent a year there. That's where I met my wife, Kathy. Mm. Um, my wife, Kathy, was raised Catholic, and her family had come into the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses uh, in her late teens, early 20s. Wow. So she was already active? Yes, she was at already. A, at a similar level to mm -hmm. you? Yes, she was what they called an auxiliary pioneer, oh. where they spent about 60 hours a month going from door to door. Wow. So, so when you two met, Got married during that time? Well, what happened was um, I had actually started having doubts while I was at uh -huh. the headquarters. And we met, and uh, th I had been there such a short time, they weren't going to accept us as a married couple there. Um, so we moved to new, to new, back to New Orleans, and I started college, and we got married. And during that time, I started reading um, different things about the Jehovah's Witnesses, mainly. Uh, it was mostly Protestant uh, converts. Uh, from the Jehovah's Witnesses to different Protestant denominations. The interesting thing, though, is that the place where I would go read these things was Loyola University of New Orleans. <laughs> <laughs> I would sneak into their library and make sure no one was following me <laughs> and go sit in the stacks and just read these books about the Jehovah's Witnesses. Um, so it was a good Jesuit institution. Yeah, yeah, there you go. um, and then um, time went on. 
we moved to uh, Arkansas where I got my doctorate in chemistry. And um, we went through a time where we really didn't have any strong religious, well, we had strong religious convictions, but we didn't know where to go. We didn't know what was true. Back up just a little bit. Sure. You, uh, um, you may not have wanted to go into this, but what was the issue that started making you doubt? Um, there were the, one of the many issues. Yeah, there, there are a variety of issues. One of them was this whole idea of the way a person is saved. The Jehovah's Witnesses teach that there are 144,000 people who are going to go to heaven and rule with Christ and see Jesus face to face. They're considered uh, declared righteous for life now. They fully partake in the um, um, ransom sacrifice of Christ. They're considered members of the New Covenant. And this is a literal? Literal number. Literal yes. number taken from Revelation. Correct. They misinterpret a scripture in Revelation. Do they know who they are? Um, yeah. Uh, there, it, there's kind of a... Is it a predestined thing? Or that, sort of. It, yeah. it's, it's kind of a weird, hard thing to explain. Okay. Um, basically what happened was one of the leaders of the Watchtower said that that heaven had a no vacancy sign <laughs> in 1935. And so you have this sort of if a person claims they're of the heavenly calling after 1935, they're sort of taken as, um, you know, kind of looked at sideways, you know, uh -huh. that sort of thing. Um, in any case, um, what happened was I started reading scripture um, more closely and uh, the rest of mankind they teach will live forever in paradise on earth, but these individuals will never get to see Jesus face to face. They're also not considered uh, part of the new covenant. They're also not considered uh, full-blown sons and daughters of God. And uh, what happened was this really bothered me. And I started reading the uh, New Testament and the book that I started reading was the book of Romans. And that scripture, um, Romans 8, I believe it's verse 17, where it talks about how God has called all of us to be his sons and daughters. And that, he, he, and since we're sons, we're also heirs. And that was the first time I really realized that God was calling me to be with him in eternity, to see him face to face. I can remember when I was first discovering this, um, I had a discussion with my mother about it. And my mother said that um, one of the hardest things she ever had to give up when she became a Jehovah's Witness was the hope of seeing Jesus face to face. That's sad. And, I think that. And, uh, and um, that really yeah. touched me. Um, it actually led me to do even more research right. into, into going into uh, um, what Christianity really taught. So, so you and your wife are married. You've got your, your, your doctorates in chemistry, and you're kind of floundering a bit, right? Well, we, I'm still working on my doctorate in chemistry, and we decided we would, we would go to the Lutheran Church. Um, I had very positive memories of being Lutheran, um, and we went to Was a, your wife open to come she with was, you? Said? She was very open yeah. to coming yeah. to the Lutheran Church with me, and we went to a Missouri Synod Church in Springdale, Arkansas, and I got very active in teaching Sunday school and things of that nature. Um, and then I had a, a opportunity to teach at Concordia University in Seward, Nebraska, which is one of the Missouri Synod Synodical Schools. And uh, I went up there in uh, January of 1999 and started teaching and became very, very actively involved in evangelism. I would uh, sp speak all over the country on the topic of cults. I would uh, assist people. I would get calls from all over the country where people would say, hey, you know, Uncle so-and-so is studying with the witnesses. What do I do now? Uh -huh. That sort of thing. And we would try to assist as best we could. I worked with a ministry based out of St. Louis who had a radio program, and I would be on that radio program and speak about those things and was very, very active. Oh. Um, the problem became, though, uh, I started meeting people who were leaving the witnesses and they were still in the process of leaving the witnesses. So was this kind of that next step for you? Right. I was right. thinking, it's interesting, there you are, you probably felt you'd, you'd come through uh, the deluge and now you've arrived. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had a great opening, opportunity for, for ministry, radio, speaking, teaching. Um, were you very, very committed at this point? Uh, you know, in other words, were you very happy to be out of the Jehovah Witnesses at this point? Oh, absolutely. So you were completely convicted and yes. a convicted Lutheran? Yes. And uh, actually, did, did you feel yourself as having, quote, come home yes. to the church of your childhood, your family's church? Absolutely, because I can remember when, when we first got to um, uh, Seward, I, I gave a, a presentation at one of the local congregations, and uh, I even said, I, I'm finally home. 
um, but God had other things That's in right. store. Okay, so <laughs> at this point, and, the, and your wife is solidly Lutheran? At this yes, point she also? was solidly Lutheran, yes. Okay, mm -hmm. all yes, right. Yes, okay, yes. now let's talk what got your heart interested in the Catholic Church. Uh, well, I started um, discussing scriptural interpretation with some friends of mine, many of whom were on their way out of the Jehovah's Witnesses. And um, since the Jehovah's Witnesses always uh, deny the divinity of Christ, that was inevitably what we would talk about when we started talking about doctrine. And, and we would read scripture, and I would tell, tell them that, you know, as Jehovah's Witnesses, we interpreted this scripture incorrectly. And then their response to me was, how do you know that? You know, what, by what authority do you know that? You know, th yeah. those kind of things. Yeah. Um, so I said, well, you know, there had to be some people who were alive around the time of the apostles who wrote down what the early church taught. So I got a CD-ROM that had the anti-Nicene church fathers on there. Early church fathers. Early church right. fathers, right. And this, maybe the audience, the significant of the anti-Nicene, it means they're before. before they the, weren't against Nicaea. Right, right, right. <laughs> they were before the Council of Nicaea. Before, in other words, so they learned the faith directly from the apostles. Correct. That's very significant about those particular fathers of the Correct. church. And I picked up um, and started reading the letters of St. Ignatius of Antioch. And I was all excited because, I mean, he clearly calls Jesus God and clearly says we worship Christ and, and all those things. And the date on those letters is around 100 A.D. or so. Yeah, yeah. And, but then he said other things that really bothered me. Um, he called the early church Catholic, and I wasn't sure what he meant by that. <laughs> and then he would say things like, um, the true church is wherever the bishop is, and you should treat the bishop as if he's Christ and all this kind of stuff. And I was like, boy, this, you know, this is really bizarre, what's going on here? To see that, you know, I kind of expected to see that maybe three centuries later, yeah, not right. that close to when the apostles had died, or actually maybe one was still alive. Right. Um, then I started looking at other books. I, I read uh, Eusebius, uh, History of the Church. I read about halfway through it, and I threw it down, and I said, this can't be, because it made the early church appear too Catholic. Um, then uh, I kept, going, and I started finding out that there were other books in uh, circulation that were claiming canonicity. And that brought up the whole question of, well, where did we get the New Testament from? Hmm. And so I went to some of my Lutheran colleagues in the theology department. I said, recommend to me a good book that will teach me about the New Testament canon. And so they recommended to me this book by Bruce Metzger on the history and development of the canon. And you read that book, and it's clear to me when I read that yeah. book. That the, that the Bible is a product of church tradition. And at that moment I was like, wow, what denomination teaches tradition and scripture? It's the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. And it was uh, hugely eye-opening, but I still wasn't ready. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> I still wasn't ready. I imagine your wife probably wasn't all that ready either. No, she was did not. Did you share this stuff with her? I, I did share some things with her and I would read different things to her and she would say, oh my goodness, what Catholic thing are you reading to me now? <laughs> and uh, things like that. All right. Um, and I just kept reading. In the meantime, I uh, started getting in touch with um, Catholics on the internet. And I ran into a friend of mine from high school who, uh, unbeknownst to me, had become an Eastern Rite Catholic priest. Hmm. And his name is Father Jim. And Father Jim and I would email back and forth, and he knew I was reading all of the early church fathers, and he challenged me to read the catechism, hmm. which I did in about six months. And that's when I came home one day and said, honey, if I'm going to be honest with God and you and others, I'm going to have to become Catholic. And your wife said, oh, goody. Uh, no. <laughs> <laughs> she said, uh, why? <laughs> but she was really good about it. Yeah. And she would say, well, you know, um, God is drawing you there for a reason, so I'm going to find out, I'm going to go with you to RCIA and find out what it is that's mm -hmm. drawing you to the church. So we went to RCIA at the Cathedral of the Risen Christ in Lincoln, Nebraska. And oh, you picked a good place. Oh, absolutely. Because <laughs> I was going to ask if you had a good RCIA program. Oh, it was well, an awesome. I was going to say that RCIA. had to be it was one an, of the best. Yes, it was very, very good. It was very, very good. And uh, he, um, Father Tucker was there. Uh, he, he led us through that, and, and Daniel the Catechist was there. And we just learned so much. Um, and I really feel like what happened to me was I had been converted on an academic level, but I'm not so sure my heart had caught caught up uh. quite yet. Because I can remember walking into the Catholic Church and, and going to Mass for the first time and seeing people do this kneeling thing and saying, what is that? And my wife would explain it to me since she had been raised. 
uh -huh. and uh, not understanding why you stick your finger in water when you walk, you know, <laughs> that sort of thing. So becoming a Catholic in that way. But then also, um, I'm not so sure my heart understood about the mercy of God and just how much God loves us until uh, my wife asked me one day what I wanted for Christmas, and I said, well, I'd like the diary of St. Faustina. Mm -hmm. um, had you heard about it from someone? I had heard about it from EWTN. Oh, okay, great. <laughs> and, everyone, and everyone was saying what a wonderful book this was. So I started reading it. Well, actually, I didn't start reading it. My wife started reading it. <laughs> she took it from me. After she gave it to me for Christmas, she grabbed it back. And, said, <laughs> and so she starts reading it, and finally we started reading it together in the evening. Um, before we would retire at night while we were doing RCIA. And that just had such a strong effect on me and my wife. And we really came to understand just how much God loves us through these writings of St. Faustina and how his love is unconditional. Because when you come out of a group like the Jehovah's Witnesses, where there's lots of rules and there's lots of punishment, particularly with shunning and those sorts of things, you really believe that God's love is conditional. And, and when you see what the saints have written, you start seeing just how much it is that God loves you, wants to reach out to you, wants to make you a full member of his universal family, yeah, the that church. full member is interesting, especially when you look at the Jehovah Witnesses' view of these two groups of folk, the 144,000 and then everybody else. And yet, as uh, illustrated by the, the button you wear of the divine mercy, I emphasize that God's mercy is to everyone. Right. His love for every single person. Correct. Correct. Yes. So you came, when did you come into the church? It'll be a year on Pentecost Sunday. All right. Yeah, okay. yeah, yeah. Had kind of a hard time because um, in order to uh, become Catholic, I had to give up my job at Concordia because you're required to be Lutheran there. And actually, my wife entered the church before me because of that. Yeah. She came back at Easter Vigil. And I can remember looking for a job and having difficulty. And I would go to this convent in the middle of Lincoln known as the Pink Sisters. And uh, they had perpetual adoration there. And I would go in and I'd say, Jesus, please help me find a job. And uh, finally, in May of uh, last year, I found this position in uh, Lakeland College in Sheboygan. And I gave my notice. And the only day that we could confirm me, it was a perfect day, it was Pentecost Sunday. <laughs> and then I turned back and said, well, you know, Pentecost Sunday, the Feast of the Descent of the Holy Spirit, right? Yeah. Well, the Pink Sisters Convent are the Holy Spirit Adoration Sisters, right? <laughs> so I think God had something planned there yeah, and, yeah. you know. You think so you're in control, but you're not. That's right. That's right. <laughs> Do you teach chemistry? I teach chemistry at uh, Lakeland College. Okay. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right. And then what did I hear this summer? You might be teaching at a Catholic university. Uh, I mean, at a Lutheran university. Yeah, right. That's right. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> that's right. summer session. That's right. Mm -hmm. uh, you had mentioned well, a couple things before we take a break. Um, first of all, it might be good to talk to the audience about the origins of the Jehovah Witness movement and how they see themselves connected to Christendom. Okay. the history of Christianity back to Jesus and the Apostles. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses came out of the Adventist movement of the 1800s. Um, they actually come off of the uh, Millerites, if you want to go back far enough. Hmm. And then they get well, I didn't know they were connected with the Yes, Adventist. they were connected okay. to the Millerites. Uh, eventually, a group known as the Second Adventist that came off the Millerites greatly influenced this young man from Pittsburgh by the name of Charles Russell. And Charles Russell started the Watchtower Society, which is the publishing house for the Jehovah's Witnesses. And then it kind of grew from there. Uh, the publishing house was established in the 1870s. Um, the way in which the Jehovah's Witnesses view themselves, they view themselves as the only true church on earth. They view Christendom as uh, being a false religion, uh, be the equivalent of any pagan religion um, out there. Um, and it uh, doesn't matter if you're Catholic or Protestant, they view all of them in the same boat. Um, they basically consider themselves the reestablishment of the true church on earth. Hmm. They saw that Jesus was just another prophet? Uh, Jesus is actually Michael the Archangel incarnate. <laughs> so uh, Jesus came down, well, before Jesus came to earth, he was Michael the Archangel. Then he becomes just basically a man. That's all he is, is a man. He dies, and now he's back in heaven as king. But they still refer to him as Michael the Archangel. Hmm. Very interesting. It's a, it's a very different Christology. Mm -hmm. Makes you want to back up a step and check out the Millerite movement to see how these people were influenced. Did they, were they themselves break away from the Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church or some other group themselves? Uh, the Millerites um, were kind of a, a, um, an interdenominational group that kept trying to predict the end of the world. All right. All right. And so they had the uh, 1844, they tried to predict the end there, and that became the great disappointment of 1844, which is where the Seventh-day Adventists come off of. 
and then you have uh, 1848, they tried again and got that messed up, and then most people went back to their respective denominations except for some of the ones that still wanted to continue to predict, and they became the second Adventists, and then mm -hmm. eventually the Jehovah's Witnesses, and now you actually have quite a few of those groups around. All so. right. In fact, the Mormons also began during that same basic period. They did, but there's not a whole lot of theological connection between right. the Mormons and the Jehovah's Witnesses, although there's some style similarities. Especially this Adventist or the second coming right, issues. Right, and going from door to door. And, and right. Right. Um, <clears throat> you also mentioned something to me earlier which I found very important to talk about, and that is that the question of why your mother, for example, when you were five, would be drawn out of Lutheran movement, uh, Lutheran church into the Jehovah's Witnesses. You mentioned this desire for family. Talk about that unique draw that pulls so many people into these groups. Yeah, I, I'm, there's some, been some research on this that people who go into these very close-knit uh, sort of fundamentalist groups uh, are looking for a new family. Um, they're looking for a place to belong. If there's some reason, I don't know, that a person might not feel like they belong with their current family, that's a place where they'll go. Uh, there's also this very strong authoritarian uh, structure that is um, attractive to some people where you can be, you know, uh, told what to do, how to think, yeah. that sort of thing in many respects. And so um, different groups have that to different degrees, but if you look at cults as a whole, um, that tends to be a draw. To and it makes sense because often, I, I think of the Mormons, often one of their biggest calling cards is an emphasis on family. And, and it's, it's kind of bizarre in a way because some of the most beautiful writings on family are things that our Pope has written in the That's Theology right. of the Body. And if I, I haven't, I've read a lot of the Mormon stuff on family and the, a lot of the Jehovah's Witness stuff on family, but nothing comes close to, to the what depth. the Catholic Church has written on families and the role of families and that sort of thing. We just have to live it out, right? I mean, that's oh, our calling, well, that, you know, that, by yeah. grace and sure. fighting against the temptations of, of being drawn into our culture right. and taking a stand for the family. I mean, that's our calling as Catholics. Correct. So, well, it's great to have you home. Okay. Yes. It's great Let's to be take here. a break. Back in just a moment with your questions for Jeffrey Schwamm. Let me give you the phone number again. It's 1 800 221 9460. If you're outside North America, you can call us at 205 271 2980. And we'll be back in just a moment. Welcome back to the Journey Home program. Uh, Jeff has been uh, sharing his uh, journey and also kind of opening up the door of discussion about the Jehovah Witness movement. And let's jump right in. We've got a, an email that's from Dan Ruskowski in Erda, Utah. Uh, two fine questions. Um, uh, God's peace be with you. Thank you, Dan. Uh, when a Jehovah Witness comes to the door and I invite them in, now, actually, that's something that a lot of people don't even do right then, you know, Correct. but uh, if you invite them in, what is the best subject to discuss with them to see that the Catholic Church is true? And then the second question is, how is the Jehovah Witness Bible different from the Catholic Bible? Dan, thanks for your email. Um, I'll take the second question first. Okay. Uh, the Jehovah's Witness Bible is different from other Bibles in, the, in that in the New Testament, uh, they remove references to the deity of Christ. Um, How do they explain that? They just um, there's a variety of uh, ways in which they ex explain that. Um, basically, they're neo Arians, meaning they followed the Christology of Arius, who was a, a third century um, uh, heretic, right. basically, right. <laughs> uh, who um, didn't believe Jesus to be God. And so, what they do is they go through and um, remove references as much as they can to the deity of Christ. Uh, many of these differences are not textually supported. In fact, you can get a copy of their own interlinear and see how they have uh, kind of messed with the text and it doesn't support their own Christology. Um, the first question is, um, 
it's very difficult uh, for you to invite a Jehovah's Witness into your home and show them that the Catholic Church is the true church. Um, there, if you'd have done that to me <laughs> when I was going from door to door, I would have just thought you were nuts, okay, and gone to the next house. What I tell people is when a Jehovah's Witness comes to your door, show them the unconditional love of Christ. And the, there's a variety of ways you can do that. One, uh, one of the best ways is to tell them what Jesus means to you. What has Jesus done in your life? How has Jesus changed your life? Mm -hmm. Tell them about Jesus and how Jesus loves you unconditionally and wants the same for that individual. Um, I think if you, if you do that, you've planted a seed. I can remember when I was going from door to door uh, many years ago, uh, I went to a gentleman's home and I knocked on his door and I said to him, I said, uh, wouldn't you like to live forever in paradise on earth? And that was the um, pitch that I gave him basically. And he said to me, no. And I said, why? And he said, because I'm going to heaven to be with Jesus for eternity and there's no better place to be than that, including a paradise earth. And I had absolutely no comeback for that. <laughs> I walked away, I looked at the person who was with me and we looked at each other and the guy with me said, do you think he had the Holy Spirit? And that was something that really got me thinking. Yeah. Yeah. But it's that, you know, tell them about Jesus. That's what I would say. You know, I remember the last time a Jehovah Witness came to our house. We live way out in the country. I mean, you got to really work hard to find us. And we're out a dirt road, and, you know, our driveway is better shaped than the road that comes to our house. And, and this old car pulled in down our driveway, and uh, the dogs are barking, the whole typical scene. And it was just chock full of ladies and uh, just stuffed in that car. And one got out and handed this thing, and kind of thank you, you want to visit, but they didn't say much. I just felt like, the, like they were doing their duty. And I wondered whether they believed it or they just completely figured we were infidels. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> I mean, I didn't even know how to respond to them. Well, in order to be a good Jehovah's Witness, you're required to go from door to door. Okay. And the organization puts a lot of pressure on people to put in a minimum of 10 hours a month. And you actually have to fill out a form and turn it into the congregation elders. So if 10 of them are crammed in a Volkswagen they all and count one the comes out, they, they all, all count? count the time. Okay. I, I just figured how they all did it. All yeah. right. mm -hmm. Okay. So in fact, those are our favorite um, things. Really? Yeah, because you could count the drive time to and from them. Oh, sure. Yeah. Okay. All right. There's always a way around it. Yes. Right? There's always a way. Let's take our first caller, Ed from Nevada. Hello, Ed. What's your question for us? Tonight? Hey, thank you very much for taking my call, uh, sure. Marcus and uh, Doctor. I really appreciate it. Uh, I had a question. Underneath your name on the television screen that we're watching here, it says Betharite. And I was wondering what that term meant and what it signified and what it uh, meant to the Jehovah's Witnesses. Thank you, Ed. Um, <coughs> people who um, work at the world headquarters and at the other branch offices of the Watchtower Society are known as Bethelites. And Bethel means house of God. And so those places are considered to be the houses of God and the people who work there are considered to be Bethelites. And that was the significance of, of that term. So I was a Bethelite for uh, one year, according to the Is that less Bethel? Bethel? Not Bethel, Bethelite. <laughs> that's <laughs> right, no. <laughs> Bethelite as in, you know, like an Israelite or that okay. sort of thing. Okay. You know. So that, that's that's you, what it meant. You weren't elevated into the 144,000. Oh, no, uh, no. Are you a higher level within the other? No, group? not really. I worked construction there and took care of their buildings and that so. sort of thing. So I was a, a volunteer worker and um, worked on their buildings that they used to print the Watchtower and their other books. All right. Yeah. Okay, let's take this next email. Jackie Hubbard, uh, SFO, from Astatula, Florida. Uh, asks, why do Jehovah Witnesses believe so strongly that Catholics are going to hell? Thank you, Jackie. Well, um, they believe that uh, after all the apostles died, the church went into apostasy. So the Catholic Church is an apostate Christian church. It's a church that's te teaching uh, falsehood. Now, as far as hell is concerned, they don't believe in the same hell that um, uh, a nominal Christian would. Uh, they believe in soul sleep, they believe in eternal non-existence. So their belief is that uh, Catholics who refuse to become Jehovah's Witnesses uh, will um, not live forever in paradise on earth and will be eternally non-existent. All right, okay, thank 
Thank you. Let's take our next caller, Paul from Maryland. Hello, Paul. What's your question for us? Well, I uh, appreciate the program very much. I'm on a journey from the Missouri Synod. Is that right, <laughs> myself, Paul? Myself, uh, a clergyman, yeah. And oh, you're in our prayers, Paul. Uh, thank you. I appreciate that very much. Uh, had wonderful help from various Catholic friends here. One uh, issue still uh, working through a bit is the Marian doctrines, and that would be something I'd like to ask of uh, Dr. Schwem. And generally, what's good mentoring for a Missouri Synod Lutheran in a time like this? Thank you, Paul. And I hope that you'll see the address about the Coming Home Network somewhere on the program, and that you'll give us a call, especially talk to Jim Anderson, because we'd like to know and do what we can to help in your journey. We don't push, pull, or prod anyone. Our goal is to stand next to you and help answer questions like this. But uh, Marian issues are often the biggest hurdle for so many coming into the right. church. And, and it was a hurdle for me as well. Um, what I did is, um, actually I started praying Hail Marys in private long before I entered the church, <laughs> um, which was kind of interesting. And uh, when I revealed that to my priest friend, he said, oh, you're, you're gonna be Catholics <laughs> any day now. <laughs> but uh, what happened is uh, if you go back and you, you look at um, John and the Blessed Mother at the foot of the cross. And when Jesus says, Mother, look your son, son, look your mother, and what does the apostle do? He takes her into his home. But he doesn't say the apostle John. He says the disciple whom Jesus loved. Yeah. And, you know, as a good Missouri Synod Lutheran, I always read the Bible as a love letter from God to me. And who is the disciple Jesus loved? He's not just the Apostle John, he's me and you and everyone. And that's how God is. Um, God doesn't just wanna give us little bits and pieces. He wants to give us everything, including his mother. And uh, that always floors me. And, and when, I, when I think about that, I think about how Jesus loves me so much that he wants to give me his mother, his father, his brothers and sisters, the saints, his entire family. He wants me to be a part of that. And that's um, something that was very powerful and drew me into the, into the church. And that's kind of how I look at the, the Marian doctrines. And I would encourage you, Paul, to check out the EWTN website. There's lots of information on EWTN.com uh, that you can look up, do a search for Marian stuff that will answer a lot of questions, as well as ask us at the Coming Home Network. If you go to chnetwork.org, you can get some information. I remember the thing that helped me in my journey on Mary. Mary was not easy because we always presume that Catholics tried to divinize her, make her God, and that's not it. What Mary is is what we would be if we were full of grace. That's the difference, full of grace. And she was protected from conception by that grace. Right, and then when you go back and you read the early church fathers, they refer to her as the new Eve. They refer to her as the Ark of the Covenant right. and, and all these things in Scripture uh, that refer to her role as the um, Mother of God. And it's an, it's an honored role, but she's our, a creature. Uh, she's our mother. She's not a goddess, yeah. as, as some would say Catholics believe. Yeah, and, and look in the Magnificat where it says in Scripture that she will be called blessed. That's Scripture. You know, do, did we, did I as a Lutheran Presbyterian, did I call her blessed? That's what scripture says she will be called. So, I mean, we're just following yeah, scripture. I can remember one time I was on an email list and I was having a discussion with one of my Protestant uh, brothers and he referred to Mary as a um, incubator. Yeah, see that's sad. And to think of any woman just as that. And, and I, um, I wasn't Catholic yet, but even then I said, you know, that's Jesus' mother, it's more than an incubator. Yeah. And, and I, I think a, a, another good book is that uh, Hail Holy Queen by Scott Hahn, which yes. really shows us how, as uh, Christians, we need uh, the Blessed Mother. I recommend another book called Mary of Nazareth by Dr. Kenneth Howell, who's been on the Journey Home program a number of times. Uh, he's a convert to the church and is very sensitive to the issues of Mary, and so wrote the book, Mary of Nazareth, sp specifically to address Mary from the perspective of a convert. So I recommend any of those books, and also Scott's book. Let's take our next email. This comes from Elizabeth in Delaware. Gentlemen, the e this Easter vigil, I came into the Catholic faith. Welcome home, Elizabeth. My son's girlfriend came over for Mother's Day and began asking about what we believe. Her aunt is Jehovah's Witness. She wanted to know where they fit with other Protestant religions. 
Could you help me answer her? Watch your show every week. Thanks, Elizabeth. Um, the Jehovah's Witnesses, like I mentioned earlier, they, they came out of the Millerite movement. Um, you could kind of think of them as theological cousins to the Seventh-day Adventists because they both come out of that Millerite movement. Um, also, uh, they deny the Trinity. Um, they don't celebrate most um, holidays. Uh, you can't have blood transfusions if you need them, and there's some other Oh, yeah, those are the things. really unique things. Right, those are some of the unique things. But it's, they, they don't view themselves as Protestant. They view themselves as the only true church on earth. And then all of Christendom, both Protestant and Catholic, is considered to be pagan and run by Satan. Basically, do they believe that that, that one man that you mentioned at the beginning, that he rediscovered it? Is that yes, how they would correct. understand it? Charles Russell rediscovered the true church and was appointed by God to be his messenger to reestablish it. They, they actually refer to... Well, in the older literature, they refer to Russell as the um, angel of Laodicea the, out, of, uh, out of Revelation, which is uh, kind of an interesting apocalyptic uh, interpretation. So it's a special messenger from God. Yeah. Wow. It'd be interesting to read his diary. Uh, you can get some of his older did literature. Did he already believe that? Did he believe himself, or was he a good salesman, or was he? Uh, he was very charismatic. He uh, evidently um, started Bible study groups all along the East Coast and and even though he wasn't physically present at all of them, all of those Bible study groups considered him their pastor. Mm. And so he was evidently a very charismatic individual who could uh, keep people wow. connecting. Yeah. All right. Let's take our next caller. Hello, Marty from Wisconsin. What's your question for us tonight? Hello? Hello, Marty. Yeah. Miriam, hi. Oh, Miriam, I'm sorry. <laughs> no problem. Hi, um, Jeffrey. Yes. Hi. Um, I wanted to ask you, uh, I'm also an ex-Jehovah's Witness. Uh, uh, welcome home. Thank you, and I'm going through RCIA right now. Oh, great. Be, uh, Our prayers are with you, Mary. Thank you, and I just wanted to ask you, Jeffrey, um, as we know, so it's not easy to make a, a clean break mm -hmm. from the uh, Jehovah's Witnesses. I wanted to ask you if you were actually disfellowshipped. Um, were you, did you have to dissociate yourself? Uh, do you have a relationship still with your mother or with any of the other um, members of the congregation you once belonged to? What What is your... You know, how did you get away, basically, is what I wanted to find out. It was not easy for me at all, and I would never tell my mother that I'm becoming a Catholic at all. Yeah. I just all right, Miriam, thank you very much. And our prayers are with you, Miriam, in your, in your continued journey. Um, it, for me, what happened was when I moved from Louisiana to Arkansas and I got out of that environment, um, it was easier for me in many respects to break away because we didn't know any of the witnesses in Arkansas and we didn't. Uh, associate with them. I did dissociate myself in 1996 when I decided to become a uh, Lutheran because I felt like I needed to make a clean break. Uh, that has strained relationships with numerous family members and with many of my friends that I grew up with. Um, so I know where you're coming from. It's a, a painful thing when people turn their back on you, uh, um, particularly to the extent that the witnesses do where you're encouraged to um, treat your relatives who've left the church as if they're dead. And um, it does make, make life very hard. Uh, I would encourage you um, to uh, look for support among your, your Catholic brothers and sisters. Um, and you're in Wisconsin, you can uh, get in touch with me. I'd be glad to um, assist in any way that I can. And uh, there's quite a few of us former Jehovah's Witness Catholics, believe it or not, and we can, uh, we can assist you along the way. All right, let's take this next email. Ron from San Antonio. Jeff, I have always wondered how the pamphlets, the booklets that the Jehovah Witness pass out are financed. Does the witness have to pay for these out of his pocket? Thank you, Ron, for your question. Uh, years ago, um, what would happen is we would go from door to door and we would ask for a contribution. So like the watchtower was like 25 cents a piece. Um, then in the mid 90s, they decided that they weren't going to ask for a specific donation. They would just let the person at the door know that you could give money if you wished. Either way, uh, the Jehovah's Witness that comes to your door pays for those um, magazines out of his own pocket at the Kingdom Hall and then comes back to your door and offers it to you. If you give them a donation at this time, they are told to put that into the contribution box at the Kingdom Hall. Oh, so they don't get reimbursed for what they paid for? Not anymore, no. Oh, very interesting. Yes. So it's, it, they're required to do so many hours, mm -hmm. which essentially means they're required to buy so many magazines. Correct. Correct. What you do is you go in and there's a, a deacon type uh, person who is in charge of the literature. You tell them how many magazines or books you want to have that month and they get that for you and you, you pay and then you 
try to distribute those. All right, okay. Uh, our next phone call, Marty from Wisconsin. Hello, Marty, what's your question for us? Hi, Marcus, thank you for taking the call. And um, I wondered why don't Jehovah Witnesses celebrate any holidays, Thanksgiving, Christmas, Easter, birthdays, of all things. Um, I wonder if you could help me well. Thank you, Marty. Um, what they do is they look at many of the traditions associated with holidays uh, and say, well, th those came from pagan origin, so therefore that makes the entire uh, holiday pagan, and so then they don't hmm. um, partake in that. Birthdays, um, they honestly believe that when you celebrate someone's birthday, you're engaging in creature worship. And so they, they, they refuse to take part in that. Um, I, I had a birthday when I was five and my next birthday when I was 30, <laughs> as far as a party. <coughs> I still, my wife says I still have to count the birthdays in between, uh, even though we didn't celebrate them. But anyway, uh, yeah, um, I think another reason, too, is that it wasn't until the 1920s that the Jehovah's Witnesses stopped doing that and uh, stopped celebrating Christmas and other things. And that had to do with their leader at that time, a guy by the name of J.F. Rutherford, who did everything he possibly could to make the witnesses separate mm -hmm. from other Christian denominations, including giving them the name Jehovah's Witnesses. Okay. They didn't take that name until Rutherford became their leader. Mm -hmm. And so I think that also has something to do with it as well. When did the idea about um, not blood transfusions or you know, the, the, the all blood, that aspect? The blood transfusion ban started in the 1960s. Really? That late? Mm -hmm. In the 1960s. In 1962, they came out with a Watchtower article that said that um, to take blood and to have organ transplants was the equivalent of human cannibalism. Mm -hmm. And then in the 1980s, they decided that organ transplants were okay, but they still haven't let up on the, or, on the, on the blood, blood transfusion. All right. I mean, if you think about it, there's just an example of when somebody lifts himself as an authority, lifts himself up as an authority with great influence, influences hundreds of thousands yes. of people, and sometimes leads to great tragedy. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. All right. Let's take this um, next uh, email from Igor in Connecticut. Tell us about Jehovah Witnesses' worship. Is there worship? Uh, is there communion? How about conventions? Okay. Baptism, is it a sacrament as Catholics understand it? Uh, the sacramental nature of things would be totally foreign to a Jehovah's Witness. Baptism is a um, outward sign that you've made a commitment to Christ or to the church. Okay, and so that's what baptism would be. Uh, when it comes to communion, they have a, a yearly event called the Memorial of Christ's Death where they will pass around the bread and the wine but the only people who are allowed to partake of that are people who have the um, hope of going to heaven to be with Jesus. And then uh, when you go to a Jehovah's Witness service, it's not really a worship service. Uh, they have some singing and they have a prayer to begin and end, but the rest of it's a class. You have someone who lectures mm -hmm. or you have a discussion on some article that's been written uh, by someone in Brooklyn, the, the headquarters, that they discuss. So it's not a worship in the Catholic sense of worship. So they're uh, a worship of God in the midst of that, though? Well, they'll sing some hymns that they write, right. that has been written themselves, but it, it's not, um, I thought the liturgy was beautiful when I first became Lutheran, yeah. and it was a totally different way to pray to God and to sing yeah. and that sort of thing. But you had five meetings a week at the Kingdom Hall, and the vast majority of them were focused on how can you go from door to door, how can you overcome arguments at the door, how you can get the literature in the people's hands, how you can get people back into the church and become Jehovah's Witnesses. Very interesting. Huh. We need to pray for those yes. who are locked step in that, I almost hate to say it, faith, because it's really more works than faith. It's a lot of work, yes, yeah. it's a lot of work. Okay, let's take our next caller, Mary from Texas. Hello, Mary. Hello. Hello, Hello. yes, what's your question? Well, I have been an active for years and years, and I need to go to another religion, but it's the first commandment that they teach is thou shalt not worship any other idols, but I, Jehovah, your God, for I am a jealous God, and your guest knows that exact same scripture that I'm talking about, and I'm so confused and I'm tore up, I feel like if I go back to where I came from, I am sinning against the Holy Spirit, which is the unforgivable sin. All right, Mary, thank you very much for your call. 
I can ask every single person that's listening and watching to be praying for you right now as you try and discern your direction because you know this is not just an issue of Jehovah Witnesses it's often with those especially any fundamentalist group you've got those voices that are always there mm -hmm. talk about the ones particularly she's talking about um, the use of images I guess is because I didn't hear the whole well, here she was talking about she's she's out of the oh, Jehovah the, Witnesses oh, okay. she's out of the witnesses but she's uh, the memory of the the verse you know that's yes, thou shalt right, right. not worship any other god it, it, you're sinned against the holy spirit so she's kind of caught sure sure uh i can remember when kathy and i first left the witnesses there's this uneasy stage that you're going to go through where you're going to be asking the same question Pontius Pilate asked which is what is truth mm -hmm. and what i would say to you is that jesus is truth okay focus on christ um Jesus is there for you. He loves you unconditionally. Um, you are asking good questions, and he wants you to ask those <coughs> questions because he's going to bring you home just as he wants to bring everyone home. When it comes to uh, going to a, a church, I can remember the first time I walked into a Lutheran church, I got physically ill because of the same things that you were talking about. But if you go back and you look at the early church, what you'll discover is that when you go to these... Um, like a Lutheran church or a Catholic church, and you see the liturgical worship, uh, the church has been worshiping in this manner since the beginning uh, with um, images and uh, other things to help with catechesis because people couldn't read back then. And if they could read, they probably didn't have enough money to own a book. And so uh, in the early church, you had um, things there that would help with catechesis. And that's basically where the use of images came from. And I, I would tell you that... Um, <coughs> you're going to go through some rough times, uh, but the Lord is with you, and uh, I understand your trepidation and, and, and the pain that you're going through right now, uh, but you'll be in my prayers, believe me, and uh, rely on God. Jesus is going to bring you home, and, and you'll, you'll enter into a family that you never knew you had, uh, just waiting to embrace you with open arms, and that family is God's family, the universal family in, on heaven and on earth. Often this issue of early church fathers comes up, as it just did again, Mary. And you know that one book that I would highly recommend as as an introduction to early church fathers is a book by Rod Bennett called Four Witnesses. Mm -hmm. Four Witnesses. It's written in a very welcoming style. Uh, what he tries to do is to take four of the most important earliest witnesses of the church who learned their faith from the apostles, directly from the apostles. And we know that, all scholars agree on that. And he talks about their own biography, quotes from their writings, what they taught, their connection with Jesus and the apostles. It's a good introduction. It's you know one of those early steps into the early fathers. Mm -hmm. Sometimes just jumping to the early fathers, there's some stuff in there that's hard to understand sure, and sure. read. But I would rec highly recommend Rod Bennett's book, The Four Witnesses. All right, let's take another break. We'll be back in a minute with some final words for the journey home. Welcome back. Our guest tonight has been Jeffrey Schwem. Quick email, then another final question. This email comes from Matt C. Abbott in Chicago. Greetings in Christ. What distinguishes a cult from a major religion? Well, it depends on how you define cult, and there's a variety of ways to do that. Some people define cult as whatever group disagrees with me, they're a cult. <laughs> That's not a very good way to do it. Um, a cult I would define as a, a group that is highly controlling and what they do is they use inappropriate um, techniques to keep people from questioning and things of yeah. that nature. In addition, cults tend to be very insular and uh, keep to themselves in many ways other than when they're proselytizing. So if you look at major religions, major religions can, can they're broad enough so that they can support an entire culture. Cults can't do that. Mm. And that's another difference between the two. You don't find too many cults committed to ecumenism? Uh, no. 
I mean, that's the it, no, they're not. It's the opposite, right? Right. right. You know, yeah. as Catholics. Our commitment to ecumenism is so that we can build relationships to help people discover the fullness Correct. of the church. Correct. So we, we welcome That's dialogue for that actually reason. Actually, one of the reasons why I became Catholic is because the Pope uh, impressed me with his work in that area. That's right. He's very committed to that. All right, Jeffrey, how, how has becoming a Catholic strengthened your faith in Christ? Well, it's strengthened my faith in Christ in that um, I actually believe what Jesus said, which is that uh, his church uh, will never die. You know, it's Matthew 16. Yeah. Uh, the church, the gates of hell will never prevail against it. Um, this understanding that I had before where Jesus just came here, started something and then left and then we're out to flailing around by ourselves. Mm -hmm. I mean that was very disconcerting for me for many years to realize that he really did leave behind a church, leave behind a, a magisterium, a teaching authority that can guide me in coming home to him yeah. and becoming a full member of his family. And then also this idea that I have uh, 2,000 years of history and stories of Christian brothers and sisters who have lived lives of holiness that I can read and, and who have taught me how to pray and taught me how to contemplate God. I never had that as a Protestant. I, I never had that as a Jehovah's Witness for sure. Um, those things have really drawn me uh, to Christ. I pray more now than I ever did as a Protestant because this church that has been praying for 2,000 years is such a good teacher at how to pray. I don't want to be uh on the one hand, too critical of the Jehovah Witnesses, but do the Jehovah Witnesses produce Mother Teresa's? Uh, no, <laughs> they don't. You know, I mean, really deeply committed to surrender your whole life for the good of others. It's it's a it's a different mindset. You know, this idea of of sacrificial love and suffering for the good of others is something that, in many cases, is uniquely Catholic. That's right. Jeffrey, thank you so much for joining us. I appreciate us here the and opportunity, and, and God continue to bless your apostolate as you, to you continue to reach out. Thank you for joining us. I do want to let you know that something pretty neat is happening. The Journey Home program, of course, has always been available on videotape from EWTN Religious Catalog, but now, starting with last week's program, it's also available on CD, so you can get the audio to stick in your CD player wherever you're traveling. If you're interested, EWTN.com or 800-854-6316. God bless you. Thank you for joining us on The Journey Home. I'll see you again next week.